Welcome to the rest of your life for an hour and a half, or at least until you click off the video. My name is Cool Nugget, and today I'm going to be ranking every single Smash character's origin games. Well, actually not today. If you don't know, this has been a series I've been doing on my channel for five months. This is just all four parts compiled into one big video. So due to that, there may be some parts where I'll say something like, this is our last character for today, or this is our first character for today, and it won't line up with the video you're watching, just know that this was originally four parts and not one big video. So let's get into it. What is an origin game? Well, I'm considering an origin game to be the first game that character is playable in. Playable is a big thing here. So for example, Ganondorf has never been playable, so he won't be reviewed. Arcade games aren't being included. They must be on a home console or a portable. I'm also not ranking the Miis specifically. I saw someone say I should, but the reason I'm not doing that is because technically me Gunner, me Sword, Fighter and me Brawler have never actually been in a game, if that makes sense. Also, Mario Kart and Mario Party games will be ranked, I just think that would make it a little bit more boring. Also, obviously Smash games will be ranked, like for example Roy's technical first playable appearance is Smash Melee, but I'm counting it as Fire Emblem Binding Blade. And with all that out of the way, from Mario to Sora, let's begin. Mario's first game is Super Mario Bros. As if I even had to say that. Everyone has heard or seen this game. It's impossible. It's the most recognizable game of all time. There really isn't much to say that hasn't already been said. But one thing I will say is all of you may have seen this game or played it a bit, but how many of you have actually 100%ed this game? So, let's go play through the whole game! Mario goes run, then he goes jump. Mario goes run, then he goes jump. Mario goes run, then he goes jump. Mario goes run, then he goes... This game is so good, but so old. The movement is fun, the level design is revolutionary for the time, but my biggest issue is just how difficult the game is. And I mean difficult, not challenging. The game isn't necessarily hard, or at least it doesn't have to be. What makes it hard is the life system and the lack of saving. If this game had infinite lives, it would be half an hour long but it takes days instead. As I explored in Are Video Games Getting Worse, old games were like arcade games but at home. This meant that they were meant to take a long time and were easy to learn but hard to master. Does Super Mario Bros. succeed at this? Mm, sort of. It's a simple concept that will take a long time to beat. Did I enjoy this? Yeah. Kinda. It is frustrating when you die and have to restart, and even with the warp zones, it can be kind of frustrating to replay so much of the game. But there's a reason it's a classic. It's super fun and created the most recognizable video game character of all time. And it created an entire genre of video games and shot the market back up. This game is something I would recommend to everyone. It's a classic game that earns its title with great movement and simple yet enjoyable mechanics. Super Mario Bros. is of course fantastic. It's just a little outdated. 7.5 out of 10. I love the Donkey Kong series. The first game I played was Donkey Kong Country Returns, and just recently I played the original Donkey Kong Country on an original SNES, and ooh boy is this a good game. My biggest issue with old games is saving, as it can cause you to replay large amounts of a game, or sometimes even the whole game just to get back to where you were. Donkey Kong Country doesn't have that problem. The saving mechanic keeps you on your toes, but isn't annoying. The level design is fantastic, and the gameplay is simple yet enjoyable. There are a ton of secret rooms to look up, offering up different rewards that will help you on your journey through DK Island. The worlds are all totally unique and have amazing themes. The graphics haven't aged all too badly and were revolutionary for the time. Donkey Kong may be in the same genre as Mario, but the games are totally different in terms of level design and game mechanics. In this one, Diddy Kong will follow you and when Donkey Kong gets hit, you play as Diddy instead and you can find Donkey Kong in a barrel. The game is constantly showing you new ideas, but it never feels overwhelming. My one issue is that some levels are much harder than others. Like, I'll get levels that will take me dozens of tries and then I'll play through the next one in one try. But the game isn't necessarily particularly worse by this. As I said, it has a good saving system, so it never feels frustrating. Overall, Donkey Kong Country is a great and fun time. 8.5 out of 10. Since this is Breath of the Wild Link, we're going to be looking at Breath of the Wild rather than the actual first Zelda game. Upon release, Breath of the Wild was praised to no end, and it really is great, but 
Recently playing it, I've realized an issue with it. When you're a pioneer, not everything you do will be perfect and your competitors could copy your great idea and make something potentially better. While I don't think a game like Genshin Impact surpasses Breath of the Wild, the game certainly has weaknesses. Breath of the Wild is so intriguing because you start with practically nothing in a paraglider and are just told to go. You could go straight to Ganon with these materials, but the game does tell you that you can go to the four corners of the map and you can find these important dungeons that will make your quest easier. Breath of the Wild constantly keeps you seeing new things, but it doesn't dawdle. Due to the way the shrines work, you can warp to most places on the map if you've already been there. What I admire so much is the way that the game is set up. Like I said before, the Divine Beasts are in the four corners of the map, meaning that no matter what way you go, it's the right way. I remember thinking that the starting area was gigantic at the beginning, but look at that compared to the rest of the map. The issue with Breath of the Wild's Four Corners is that it can feel too low or high leveled compared to where you are in the game. The game isn't really hard, so most of the time in my playthrough I felt over leveled. I went to Zora's Domain first, however, and I ended up not even fighting the Lionel as it was too hard and I didn't have enough stuff. I didn't get Breath of the Wild when it first came out, as I had never played a Zelda game before and I had other games I wanted, but since buying it about a year ago, I haven't stopped discovering new side quest mechanics, creatures, and weapons. Breath of the Wild is nothing short of phenomenal and is essential to any Switch owner. It's frankly amazing just how big and how many ideas were put into this one game, and I will definitely make a longer review soon. 9 out of 10. I really like the Metroid series, and I am excited for Metroid Dread, but the original Metroid is just not good. It feels a lot like the original Castlevania in the sense that there's no reason to go back to it, unless you're curious what the first Metroid was. The game is super basic, and like a lot of other NES games, it's fun but it's just so old. I have a lot of respect for the NES era of games, but most games, although revolutionary for the time, haven't aged too well. I think with the SNES having many sequels to NES games, it makes most of them feel obsolete, and Metroid is certainly one of those. Super Metroid is one of the best games on the SNES, and so the original Metroid has no real reason to play. It's confusing, sprawling, frustrating, and difficult. With all that said, however, the game is still extremely interesting, and is an okay NES game. Not the greatest or an essential for the system, but still pretty good. I don't have much to say about this game besides it's basic and there are better alternatives. It did introduce the Metroid universe to video games, however, so I'll give it a 5 out of 10. Yoshi has a pretty subjective first game. Some would say it's Yoshi on NES or Yoshi's Cookie, but I think I'm going to go with the original Yoshi's Island. Although I've heard of this game previously, I haven't actually played it all that much. The first thing I noticed when loading in is the atmosphere of the game. It's very cute and just feels nice. The story is that baby Mario fell onto Yoshi Island and is trying to be caught by Kamek, but the Yoshis will guide him as far as they can. The gameplay isn't really like Super Mario World, despite it being called Super Mario World 2. Instead of stepping on enemies, you most of the time will swallow them up and then turn them into eggs, and then you can throw those eggs at other enemies or items. The levels have a ton of little collectibles, whether it be red coins, flowers, stars, or 1-ups. The collectibles give you two options, go through the level as fast as possible, or look for all the little collectibles. The game has fun enemies and bosses, great level design and ideas, and once again, great atmosphere. So why don't I like this game? Maybe it's just because I wasn't in the mood to play a game like this, but I found that I had to force myself to play this game a lot more than the others. The game is still fantastic, but I just felt bored a lot, I guess. Overall, Yoshi had a great first game, 7 out of 10. Kirby's Dream Land is so incredibly fun and I have no idea why. Playing through this game just feels so nice. It's such a fun little game and one of my favorites for the original Game Boy. It doesn't really have a lot of problems I find with other games from this era. First, the saving system is really good, saving after each level you complete. Second, the gameplay of Kirby is so good yet so simple that the other games don't just feel like this one but better, rather they feel like if the games kept changing theming and ideas. The game is developed by Masahiro Sakurai, known most for his work on Smash. However, all the games he's developed have had the same fundamental idea, bringing together casual and hardcore video game players together to enjoy one experience. Kirby's Dream Land is exactly that, complexity delivered within simplicity, and although this game is quite simple, it isn't boring. 
I had that constant rush while playing this, like every move could be my last, but it didn't frustrate me because I knew I would only have to replay each level from the beginning. The gameplay may surprise people who are used to the newer Kirby games, as there are no copy abilities in this game. Kirby can only attack by inhaling enemies and then spitting them back out. Besides that difference, it's the type of simple Kirby gameplay that is enjoyed by all. Overall, Kirby's Dreamland is a great and simple game that started out one of my favorite platforming series. 8 out of 10. I'm sorry. I've never been that big of a fan of Star Fox, but I can absolutely see the appeal of the games. They're all fun in their own way, but I would never spend money on one if I didn't have to. The original Star Fox for SNES isn't bad, but I still have a few problems with it. First of all, and probably most noticeably, the graphics, which were once cutting edge and revolutionary, just aren't anymore. Perspective is sometimes hard to understand, and the way your R-Wing moves sometimes is just odd. I tried the different control methods and really never got properly used to any of them, as much as I may hate how many newer games have really complicated and long tutorials, this game just leaves too much up in the air. If I have to look up what something does more than three times, there's a problem. However, it is still a Star Fox game and one of the best SNES games, and one that I think any owner should have. It has a fun idea and executes it as well as it could. The characters are interesting and the whole game honestly doesn't look that bad. It's very good at being atmospheric, which is something I've noticed a lot with these older games. It's like, wow, I'm really an animal in a spaceship. And not every game makes you feel like that. That's right, screw off Breath of the Wild. Yeah right, 10 out of 10. Look, I'm a mammal in a ship. My biggest gripe with this game is just how much fun its follow-ups are, so I would rather play those. Overall, Star Fox is fun and it doesn't have too many problems. 7 out of 10. Although the Pokemon technically aren't playable, I will be including the Pokemon's origin region on this list, just to keep things more interesting. Another issue is that the Pokemon games release two or more alongside each other with slightly different gameplay and stories, so how will I decide which one to play? Whatever I feel like. So first, Pokemon Red. Pokemon Red is a classic that saved Nintendo's system and breathed new light into the Game Boy. It's the most profitable media franchise of all time, and Pikachu is only second to the Mario Bros in terms of pop culture video game icons. Now here's the part where I say that despite this big media franchise, the first game is actually pretty weak and the series got way better as it went on. Yeah, kinda. But the first game is still really good. It has 151 Pokemon, which is a lot to catch, and it can be fun to complete the Pokedex. The story is actually really solid when you're trying to become the greatest Pokemon trainer of all time, but you get interrupted by Team Rocket and end up thwarting their plan. The characters are pretty good for such an old game. The graphics are great for a Game Boy game, and the battles are surprisingly not that boring. If I have one issue with this game, it's that it's been remade so many times, I don't see why you would go back to play this one. Just play Fire Red instead, in my opinion. Still a great game. 8 out of 10. While technically Luigi's first game is Super Mario Bros, his first solo adventure is Luigi's Mansion, so that's what I'll be rating. Luigi's Mansion is basically a tech demo for the GameCube to show just how strong it was. Instead of beginning with a Mario game like every system before it, it began with a spin-off about everyone's favorite luck-based Smash character. No, not him. No, not him. No, not- I'm talking about Luigi. Luigi's Mansion is a very short and simple game. You could beat it in a few hours, and the gameplay is nothing revolutionary. The theming, however, is what's so good. The mansion isn't legitimately scary, but it does have quite the unsettling vibe to it. Along with all that, the ghosts in this game are either booze or look like real dead Mario characters. Luigi's Mansion also has a ton of little secrets and ways to play that rewards players for searching through the mansion. Whether it be booze, speedy spirits, treasure, plants you can water, golden mice, all that keeps you exploring looking for the next treasure. The controls are also very good and showed off just how versatile the GameCube controller is. Finally, the bosses in this game are all really good, and I'm talking about area bosses and as well as the regular ghosts you capture. They all have some specific way to reveal their heart allowing you to catch them, but you're never told explicitly what to do. Overall, Luigi's Mansion is a fun, albeit short, experience. 7.5 out of 10. Earthbound is such a good game that nowadays there are so many games similar to it that Earthbound games has become its own genre of RPGs. 
I've played games like Omori, but until now I hadn't really played Earthbound, and I must say, this game certainly is good and lives up to its reputation. I don't like a lot of older RPGs, but this seems to be an exception. I love the style of this game. Most older RPGs take place in some fantasy world full of magic, meanwhile Earthbound takes place in suburban America. In most RPGs you fight giant monsters, meanwhile in Earthbound you fight bullies and slugs. The music is also wacky, but kind of great in its own way. There were songs I had heard and I didn't even know that they were from a video game, much less Earthbound. The main thing I dislike about older RPGs is the grindy nature of them, and while Earthbound has a little bit of that, it's still fun. The quirky nature of the story also helped to keep me entertained and had me genuinely laughing sometimes. It's just the little things like you calling your dad to save your game, there being an I don't care button, the dog that has a soul of a video game developer, and Pokey's mom killing Buzz Buzz. The game has a very distinct personality like no other and it keeps it fresh. If I have one issue, it's the saving. The way it works is that you can lose one battle and you'll have to replay 15 minutes of a dungeon you were already halfway through. But the battles are fun and feel rewarding, the money system is cool and the dialogue is great. The graphics are really vibrant and I thoroughly enjoyed my time with this game. Overall, Earthbound is a must have for any SNES owner. 9 out of 10. F-Zero has become a forgotten franchise over the year, and it mostly stems from it starting as a racing game on the SNES, only to be overtaken by Super Mario Kart. Although, I have to say, I like F-Zero on SNES more than Super Mario Kart. I've been pretty vocal about not liking Super, but F-Zero is great. Part of the reason I dislike Super Mario Kart are the bad controls, the graphics, the items, the CPUs. F-Zero just has more tight controls, better graphics in my opinion, no items keeping the game simpler, and better, more fair CPUs. At its core, F-Zero has simple gameplay. It's just a racing game with 5 laps. Every lap you must be above a certain threshold or you'll be eliminated. There's also this energy bar in the top right that will go down every time you hit a wall. If it goes all the way down, your car explodes, and you can recharge it by going on these strips. The game is meant to be really fast, and I would say it accomplishes that goal. It feels fast-paced, and I even need to slow down sometimes just to take a break and make sure that I don't hit anything. If I have one gripe with this game, it's that it can be pretty hard to properly drift, so I tend to just take turns slowly rather than drift. However, after playing this first game, I can see how good F-Zero is, and it's frankly shocking that we've gone this long without a new game. Overall, F-Zero is a simple racer that accomplishes what it wants to. 7.5 out of 10. Super Mario Bros. 2, baby, game of the year. Sorry, I've always wanted to do that. Super Mario Bros. 2 isn't one that's often talked about. Usually, people go from the original to 3 and then to World. I think it's mostly because Super Mario Bros. 2 is a reskin from another game, being Yume Kojo Doki Doki Panic. This means that Super Mario Bros. 2 isn't really its own separate game. This explains why it's so different from the other Mario games. Instead of jumping on your enemies, you can stand on top of them and have to pick them up to throw them at others. There are also a bunch of turnips on the floor that you can use to throw at other enemies. This game basically revolves around you picking up things, whether it's bombs on the floor or boss fights. Another fun fact is that this game is where Birdo came from, with her being at the end of every level. That means that Birdo was technically in a Mario game before Yoshi. This game is quite the odd one, and I enjoyed my time with it. I think that the mechanics in this game are fun and interesting, but my two biggest issues are the level design and the life system. Instead of getting 100 coins for an extra life, you have to dig up a potion, throw it on the ground in this weird upside down world, and then pluck turnips to get coins. At the end of the level, you will then roll a slot machine with those coins, and you can get extra lives through there. The issue is how uncommon this is. And not only that, it's so detrimental when you run out. You get two continues after losing all your lives, and after that, you go all the way back to the beginning. And there isn't the same cheat code in the original where you can continue from the world you died in. You just go all the way back. Overall, Super Mario Bros. 2 is interesting and creative. 7.5 out of 10. Super Mario Land for the Game Boy certainly does look like it's for the Game Boy. This is Daisy's first game because instead of saving Peach, you save Daisy, the princess of Sarasa Land. Back to the graphics. I mean, look at this brick. Are you really expecting a top quality looking game? Super Mario Land is even more bare bones than the original. The game is so weird and just changes so many things. Just to name some, the Koopa shells are now bombs, the fireball power up is now a ball, you'll fly in a spaceship at some point, there are a ton of odd enemies and the whole game just feels very different from a normal Mario game. 
The controls are pretty poor, but that may just be because it's on the Game Boy. The game looks pretty bad and is super short. There are only 16 levels and none of them are particularly long. So although the game is pretty bad, it just kind of has this charm to it, I guess. It's like, wow, this is a terrible game, but I kind of love it for that. It just feels so different. Overall, there isn't really much to be said about this one. It's pretty weird, but absolutely charming. 7 out of 10. If I'm not mistaken, Bowser's first playable game is Mario & Luigi Bowser's Inside Story. I've been a fan of the Mario & Luigi series for a long time, and this is no worse than the other ones. It has a good story, good gameplay, and a good battle system, and seeing Bowser in this way is great. I won't spoil it, but the final boss is also fantastic. I don't really have much to say about Bowser's Inside Story, it's just a great game that doesn't have too many problems in my opinion. A great RPG series by Nintendo. 8.5 out of 10. Ice Climbers isn't like most other games on this list. There was never a sequel or a remake to the original NES game, it just remained an NES game. This means that there isn't a better version of this game like there is with most other NES games. Ice Climbers also really stays true to the arcade games that inspired it. Although it's very mild, there is still kind of a progression and story in games like Super Mario Bros, but Ice Climbers doesn't really have that. It's very arcade feeling and a game that needs practice and can be kind of repetitive. But looking at this game as what it's trying to be, it is quite fun. In this game, you play as this climber guy named Popo who's trying to get to the top of this mountain. You can use your hammer to break blocks and attack enemies. Once you get to the top, there's this little bonus and then you move on to the next level. There are 24 levels, all with different levels of difficulty and new mechanics. The game has good progression and is pretty fun, but my one issue is the way the climbers move. They're very slow on the ground and even worse in midair. You can barely even move in midair, so you have to jump at just the right spot or you won't make it. Which can get quite frustrating, especially with so many moving parts in a level. Overall, it is a good yet really simple game with some movement problems. 6.5 out of 10. Sheik and Zelda both have their first playable appearance in Hyrule Warriors, which is technically a side game, but I'm gonna count it here. Hyrule Warriors wasn't a game I liked that much, as I didn't really know what I was getting into. It's a Warriors game, making it more of a 3D beat-em-up compared to the more story-driven dungeon crawler Zelda. It isn't that bad, and was a pretty good time, but I did notice a fair amount of frame rate drops, especially playing with others. It has fun ideas like the character customization and crafting systems, the campaign is pretty good and it does feel like a good Warriors game. The gameplay can feel somewhat repetitive however, which can be attributed to the game style, but similar games like Final Fantasy XV and Persona 5 Strikers didn't really feel like that. Despite me generally preferring the normal Zelda games, I did thoroughly enjoy Hyrule Warriors. Overall, Hyrule Warriors is a great game, but it can be held back by the system it's on. 7.5 out of 10. Our final character for today, Dr. Mario, has a great game, but there isn't much I can say about it, because it's a puzzle game. You have these little viruses that are three different colors and pills drop from the sky, and you have to stack four colors on top of each other to get rid of the viruses. The pills can either be two colors or a solid pill worth two. It's fun enough for a puzzle game, but overall there isn't really much to say. Dr. Mario is fun and it is a good time, and it does have a pretty good progression system. 7.5 out of 10. As I explained in my previous video, we'll be looking at the origin region of Pokemon, and I'll be choosing randomly between the two. So here we'll be looking at Pokemon Silver. I'm a big fan of Pokemon games in general, but one thing I never liked that much was the Game Boy games, just because their remakes were better. But after playing it, I've realized that Pokemon Silver isn't actually that bad. It has a cool story and some great new Pokemon. I especially like the new starters, they're not talked about enough. Pokemon Silver in general is just such an upgrade from Red. I still think the same thing with Red, however. I believe that the series has definitely gotten better with time, and that this game has been remade with Soul Silver, so I would rather play that. I still have a ton of respect for the early Pokemon games, and I don't think Silver is talked about nearly enough. I always hear people talk about Red, and then they just skip right to Ruby. 
but Silver is a great and underrated game and, in my opinion, it's an amazing improvement from Red. But although I would call it better and it is evolved, it's still very reminiscent of the previous game, especially in terms of looks and gameplay. I still sometimes find the random encounters annoying too, but it's nice that you can save anywhere. Overall, Pokemon Silver is a pretty good upgrade from the original Red, 8 out of 10. I can't do Marth. Marth's first game is Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light. The issue is, it's Japan only, and so therefore I can't properly translate the game to play it. I also can't find its ROM online, so I can't emulate it. There was a remade version for the Switch in English, but come on, this much money for a game that consistently gets below a 70? So I'll give it a 5.5 and we'll pretend it never existed. <sighs> I had to cover one eventually. Fire Emblem is one of Nintendo's flagship RPG series, which was originally in Japan, but was brought over to the West, blah, 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 whatever. I'm not that big of a fan of this series, if you can't tell. But I do have some friends who are, and using my own gameplay along with the internet, I will give as unbiased a review as I can of each game. First, we have the relatively new Fire Emblem Awakening, starring Lucina, daughter of Krom. Fire Emblem games are kind of like turn-based action RPGs. The best way I can describe it is if chess was a turn-based fantasy RPG. You play as a tactician named Robin and help command these people into battle for something. Honestly, I didn't pay attention to the story. But one thing that's super great is the character development throughout the game. One super interesting thing is that if a character dies in battle, they're dead in the game and are no longer in the story, which gives each battle the proper amount of stakes it should have. With each action, it feels like the story is changing and you're making it your own destiny rather than it being predetermined. From what I've heard, it's a good story, but not the best in the series. The graphics and music are both beautiful. The music especially is always appropriate and just phenomenal. The gameplay is sharp and super interesting. You being a tactician allows for the gameplay to feel much more fluid and relate to the story more. Overall, Fire Emblem Awakening is a great game, but the story isn't as strong as similar games. 7.5 out of 10. Everyone has their own favorite game, but there are a large group of gamers who consider The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time to be the best game ever made. Are they right? No. But Ocarina of Time is a triumph in gaming history and was possibly the greatest game at the time. So much is correct with this game, the theming, the story, the gameplay, even the graphics haven't aged that badly. The world is so big and feels so expansive and all the areas are so well themed. The characters are all great, the controls are surprisingly good for being such an old game on the Nintendo 64. Everything feels so natural. But my one issue is it can sometimes be hard to hit enemies with the way directions work. It can sometimes feel like they place the enemies like in a 2D Zelda game where you can only move in 4 directions but expected you to get them in 360 degrees. But honestly, it's the smallest of complaints. The story starts with you as a kid going on this epic quest given to you by Zelda to prove that the Gerudo Ganon is lying to the king. But after you open the door of time, everything just becomes evil. The whole game suddenly has such a somber feeling to it. Everything is just sad. And the whole game, in general, takes on a much darker tone than it previously had. Your quest becomes to slay Ganon after he gains the power of the Triforce. The contrast between the young and jovial Link compared to the adult stuck in this dying world is great. Well, not great, but you know what I mean. This is the type of game that defined what gaming would be like in the future. I think everyone can agree 3D Zelda is the way the series should be, and this was the first 3D Zelda. And while I wasn't alive yet, I'm sure for a long time Nintendo fans it was magic to see The Legend of Zelda in this way. This wasn't the first 3D adventure game, but it might as well have been. What Ocarina of Time did to the Zelda series and gaming as a whole simply cannot be understated, and I have the highest amount of respect for this game. I'm giving Ocarina of Time a 9.5 out of 10, which puts it at the number one spot on my list. Fire Emblem The Binding Blade is another game that hasn't been translated yet, and so I once again have no way to play it. So I just look at some reviews of the game and from what I'm seeing, it's just more of the same from Shadow of Dragon and The Blade of Light. It seems to be a bit better in terms of graphics and design and gameplay, the characters also seem a bit better, so overall I'll give it a 7 out of 10, but don't listen to what I say. We've got 3 Fire Emblem characters down and I haven't had to play 2 of the games. Let's see how long I can keep this up.
Game & Watch Ball is by far the oldest game on this list. For anyone who doesn't know, the Game & Watch was a brand of LCD screen handheld by Nintendo before they even made the NES. The Game & Watch systems had just one game, the first one being Ball. It's a fairly simple game where you juggle these balls and keep them in the air as long as you can. It's quite addictive, and while it's not something you would sink hours and hours into, I can see picking it up from time to time just for a quick game. The system in general is very high quality and looks great for such an old system. It works extremely well too. Like I said before, it's quite a simple game so I can't say much about it. Overall, I have a ton of respect for the Game & Watch line of systems. Video games may not exist the way they are without it. Without the Game & Watch, Nintendo wouldn't have begun making consoles, and then Sony wouldn't have begun making consoles, and then Microsoft wouldn't. So, I'll give Game & Watch Ball a 7.5 out of 10. This is the first remake on our list, this game being Kirby's Nightmare in Dreamland, a remake of Kirby in Dreamland. I already reviewed that game in part 1, and my opinions are the same on this one. Kirby has always been a series that's meant for beginners and experienced gamers alike, and this game is great at that. It isn't a particularly hard game, but it isn't mind-numbingly easy either. This game is very similar to its original, with the biggest difference being the graphics, and color being added to the game. Not only that, but the mild framerate problems in the original are now gone. Meta Knight can be unlocked from completing the extras mode, so that's why this is his first game. Overall, this is a fantastic game, and even better than the original, but I already reviewed that, so go watch part 1 if you want more in-depth thoughts about the game itself. 8.5 out of 10. Pit was added to Super Smash Bros. Brawl, and in that game he was also known as... who? Nobody knew who this guy was, because he only had two games and nobody played any of them. And listen, I know some of you played the first Kid Icarus game. I don't need you in the comments going, I played the first Kid Icarus game, we're married and have three children. Masahiro Sakurai himself made a new Kid Icarus game later, which is super good and you should play. But here we're looking at the original Kid Icarus. Kid Icarus has a stigma for being challenging and frustrating. And the rumors are true. I hate this game. I'm joking. Kind of. The game isn't bad, it looks pretty good for an NES game, the controls are super solid and the idea is great, and the characters are really cool. The one issue is oh my god this game is too hard. It is so incredibly challenging, and I like this game a lot but it's just so hard to play. I feel like most people who like Kid Icarus probably haven't even beaten this game. It's kind of unfortunate because avoiding the blaringly too hard difficulty, this is a really solid NES game. Like I said before, great controls and design in general. Overall, Kid Icarus would be a good game if it weren't for its difficulty, but for now, it's just average. 6.5 out of 10. I love WarioWare so much. It may be my favorite spin-off series Nintendo has ever made. I don't think I've ever disliked a WarioWare game. I'm a big fan of the concept of microgames, and I think it's great and an underrated party game. The first WarioWare is one of the only ones I haven't played, so this is a completely new experience for me. Upon playing the game, one of the things I noticed is how little the series has changed over time, which sounds like a bad thing, but they got it pretty correct the first time. Basically in WarioWare, you play as these different characters who are doing certain tasks, and to do those tasks, you play microgames. The game goes on forever until you lose four times, and you play as different people for a different selection of minigames. I found the gameplay of this game to be surprisingly great. As we've seen throughout this series, a lot of characters' first games aren't as polished or as good as the newer ones, which is understandable as it takes time for developers to find exactly how they want to design a game. WarioWare, however, is great on the first try. The microgames are addictive and fun, the progression is great, the characters are all interesting, and overall the game oozes quality. My biggest problem is how few microgames there are. The ones that we got are great, but I just wish there were a bit more of them in the game, so I won't see as many repeats. Overall, WarioWare Inc. Mega Microgames is an enjoyable and fantastically put together package. 8.5 out of 10. There isn't much I can say about Snake. I honestly didn't know this game even existed. I thought the original Metal Gear Solid for the PS1 was the first game in the series. This game is fine, but kinda old. Metal Gear Solid is so good that there isn't really much of a reason to play this, as it's just kinda that, but worse. I thought it was a competent enough experience though. I did enjoy my time with it. Overall, I just don't have much to say about this game. It's very old and simple compared to his newer appearances. 7 out of 10. Ah. <sighs> 
another one already. Normally I don't care about Fire Emblem representation in Smash, but I just do not enjoy these games, and having to play so many of them is exhausting. Path of Radiance is another great game, but it just isn't as good as the other in the series. Similar to Lucina, the game is better than Awakening though, in my opinion. Better storytelling and the characters are, in my opinion, better. Let me stress, in my opinion. I have no idea what I'm talking about. I'm gonna be honest, I can't say much about this game. It's good, but god please let me talk about more stupid Nintendo platformers. Mother 3 is a game that many people who aren't super into Nintendo don't know about. Why? It was never translated and remains in Japanese only. Fan translations exist, but come on Nintendo. So you may ask, why hasn't it been ported after all these years? Well, in my opinion, this is one of, if not the darkest and mature Nintendo game. Characters swear death is all around, and I mean real death, and the whole game feels very dramatic and not like your average Nintendo game. I'll try my best to not spoil anything major, but I will talk about a few plot elements. You play as Lucas, and it's very similar to Earthbound gameplay-wise. The battle system is very similar, and so are the graphics, which is amazing considering this is on the GBA. The dialogue is as sharp as ever, but once again, this is a fan translation, but from what I've heard, it's very faithful to the original. It also fixes quite a few things I thought were annoying about Earthbound. I never liked how you had to open this menu to interact with things, but now you can just press A and interact. The story of Mother 3 is beautiful and possibly the best of any Nintendo game. It doesn't censor anything and holds no bards. This is a dark story with a truly devastating end. The storytelling and theming and music is all sublime and places Mother 3 on a level of its own. As much as it's a joke, localize Mother 3 Nintendo. 9 out of 10. I never really played Sonic games, as I was born after the Golden Trilogy and never owned any of the other games, other than Colors, which I did enjoy. I always saw Sonic and parody Flash games online, and I honestly thought that's where he was from. Recently, however, I became enlightened by the god himself. What I'm saying here is that I'm not the most qualified to talk about Sonic, ask this guy for that. Despite that, I did play the first Sonic game, and besides giving my thumb something to do for a couple days, I did enjoy the game. I played a lot of Sonic 2 and 3, and enjoyed both of them more, however. To be honest, I didn't really like a lot of the stuff in this game. It has a lot of that old NES, SNES era bull honky that I hate. A lot of trial and error, a lot of unfair deaths, a lot of weird design where mechanics aren't properly explained or shown too soon. I like the Spin Dash, almost as much as Sakurai, and the Spin Dash doesn't even exist in this game. I found a few times I had to keep running around in a bowl as I was stuck and couldn't get enough momentum to go across to the area I needed to. There are a few levels in here that are super fun like Green Hill Zone and... So the levels aren't too interesting. I'm sorry, but almost every zone in this game is outmatched by Green Hill, and that's why everyone remembers it. Also because Sega loves to shove it in every game they possibly can. The game has some bonus stages that you can get to by jumping into this ring at the end of a level, and they're... whatever. You can get a few power-ups, but none of them are really that impactful. I know a lot of people like Sonic 1, and it's not that I didn't enjoy the experience, but I just think 2 and 3, and maybe even CD, are better. Overall, Sonic 1 just has some growing pains, but it's still a fun, competent, and well-put-together experience. 8 out of 10. I'm gonna be completely honest, I don't know if I'm right when I say that Kirby's Return to Dreamland is King Dedede's first playable game, but I'm gonna say it is because it allows me to talk about a game from my childhood. Kirby's Return to Dreamland wasn't my first game, but I have the most memories of playing this one and Donkey Kong Country Returns. I remember so many levels from this game. I'll never forget how big of a twist it was when I realized that there were two whole worlds left after the first five, and Magalore being the villain left me in shambles. Also, this is one of the coolest final bosses in a platformer. I love Kirby, and it's been great replaying his games for this series. I've mentioned in other videos, but Kirby has the perfect balance between not frustrating, but not mind-numbingly easy. I did die a few times in this game, but it didn't frustrate me like a lot of the other games I've played. The copy abilities in this game are also all fantastic. And we have these new super strong power-ups, which is where Kirby gets his final smash from. Another great new addition is these rooms that are like race to the finish. If I'm remembering correctly, these bosses at the end of those rooms are completely optional, and you only fight them if you want the gears they have. Speaking of gears, there are three per level and they work as this game's collectibles. The level design is so good that four player multiplayer works within them. You can either play as four Kirby's or you can play as King Dedede, Meta Knight, and a Waddle Dee. 
Now, you may ask, but how do you get copy abilities if you weren't Kirby? And that was a stupid question, and you should be ashamed. But the way it works is that DDD constantly has the hammer power up, Meta Knight has the sword, and Wall D has the spear. So they're like Kirby, except they can't lose their copy abilities. Also, inside Magalore's ship, you can find these copy ability rooms where you race to the finish and try to collect as many coins as you can. There's also this robot fighting one, and the best mini game ever, Ninja Dojo. I love Ninja Dojo. Sometimes I boot up this game just to play that. The controls are great, the level design is great, the bosses are great, everything overall is just so good. I would say this is a very consistently good game. Overall, Kirby's Return to Dreamland is just consistently great. 8.5 out of 10. Pikmin 1 is a game that is good, but there isn't really much I can say. In Pikmin 1, you play as this guy named Olimar, who is sent to a planet to find treasure so that his company can make more money. However, on the way you get hit by an asteroid and your ship ends up crash landing, and it's soon realized that the ship can't be easily repaired. But on the planet, you find these little helpful creatures that you name Pikmin. The Pikmin will follow you and do tasks like take stuff back to your ship or attack enemies, and any Pikmin who aren't with you at the end of the day are eaten by nocturnal creatures. Your goal is to find the parts of your ship within 30 days, as after that you die from your life support ending. While you have to find the parts of your ship, you're also tasked with finding materials that will make you money. The kinds of monsters you find are super well designed. The kind of art style Pikmin has reminded me of the amazing world of Gumball. The mix between the real world objects and the cartoony Pikmin and Olimar is great. The controls also work surprisingly well, although the Wii controls will always be superior. The sounds and music are both fantastic as well. The ambience is all just great in this game, and all the different Pikmin are great because they all have their let alone tasks to do. My one problem is that this game is a bit too short because of the 30 day limit, and I feel like 2 and 3 go a little further with the game's ideas. Overall, Pikmin 1 is a great start to one of my favorite Nintendo series. 8 out of 10. I'm counting Alf for two reasons. One, he has a different name than Olimar, and I think that's good enough. And two, I want to talk about Pikmin 3. I played Pikmin 3 before 1 and 2, meaning that I have way more nostalgia for this game than the others. But after I've played all of them, I would still say that 3 is objectively the best. The puzzles bossed by its new Pikmin and new mechanics are all too good and just feel so fresh. The game feels wildly different from the first two. While the first two seemed kind of like they were closely connected, 3 feels like a bit of a soft reboot with an all new cast of characters. Olimar and Louis are characters, but you never really play as them and they're only referenced to prior to the fourth area. So the game kind of feels completely different. You even meet some new Pikmin friends on your adventure. Specifically, the Rock Pikmin and the Flying Pikmin. Both are pretty self-explanatory. However, the game replaced the old Purple Pikmin and Purple I get. The Rock Pikmin kind of take their place, but White Pikmin were really interesting and I kind of wish they were still there. The game starts off pretty creatively with a ship malfunctioning and you, playing as Elf, get stranded and have to find your teammates. You find your first teammate very quickly and befriend the Pikmin as you trace your captain's trail and you find he's inside this large moth thing. After slaying the moth, he pops out and the game really begins. The three-person setup is so interesting because, for example, you can have one go do the main mission, one go get fruit, and the other go get new Pikmin or the special berries. Speaking of that, these berries will fill up this glass, and if you spray a glass on your Pikmin, they become much more powerful and fast. And speaking of fruit, instead of getting it for money like in the first game, you have to get them to survive. Each fruit has a different amount of juice inside of it, and at the end of the day, all your fruits will be juiced for consumption. The entire time you're chasing someone who stole your dry key, which is the only way to get home, and that turns out to be Olimar. You get it back, and the game ends. Overall, I really like Pikmin 3. It feels so freeing to do whatever you would want to on a specific day. I used to love mapping out my days and what I would do with them. 9 out of 10. We skip Gen 3 because there is no Gen 3 rep and smash, and we move on right to Gen 4 with Pokemon Diamond and Pearl. Pokemon Diamond was the first mainline Pokemon game on the DS. Before this, it was just a bunch of spin-offs, and honestly, it's kind of amazing how much they nailed it the first time. This is one of the ways to show off how the DS's dual screens weren't just a gimmick and could actually provide integral aspects to a game. The whole menu on the bottom screen and the characters on the top works super well. You can tell it works because they use it on every Pokemon game on the DS or 3DS. The new Pokemon here are also all great. This may be one of the best generations in that regard. The graphics look pretty good for being the first game on the DS, and the music is just as sharp as ever. The story, however... Look, I know Pokemon game strength isn't their stories, but this game is just a little bit too much sometimes. 
It's so similar to the previous games. They all have the exact same story. I will become the greatest trainer. Uh-oh, domestic terrorism. The legendary Pokemon will be mine because I defeated the big bad guy. I am the best Pokemon trainer to ever live. It's a tried and true formula that has been basically the exact same since the first game. But while Pokemon Diamond doesn't deviate too much from this formula, it's still really good. The game in general is fine, normal Pokemon gameplay of catching monsters and making them fight to the death. The gym leaders are also all really cool, and after playing two of the Game Boy games, I can appreciate how much this game evolved the series, but it still does feel kind of stuck in the past in terms of gameplay. Overall, Pokemon Diamond is a great step forward for the first DS game, 8 out of 10. The final Zelda game I'll be taking a look at. The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker is possibly the most out of the box Zelda. After Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask being such dark games, I think it's fair to say many expected a much nicer looking dark Zelda game. And well... The legend is back. Many people actually didn't like The Wind Waker upon reveal, stating that it looked too family friendly after the dark and gritty Majora's Mask was critically praised to no end. But after playing Wind Waker, I absolutely love this game. I played HD when it came out, but after playing the original, it's kind of crazy that this game from 2003 is still so fantastic. It takes place 100 years after Ocarina of Time, and you play as this kid who's given this grand journey after his sister is kidnapped by this bird thing. You use this boat to sail to different islands to either shop, fight enemies, find new villages, or find new dungeons. The game is seemingly non-linear, and to a certain extent, it is. You can choose which island to go to initially, except for some, and each has something for you to do on. However, the game does somewhat flow you through where it wants you to go. This is no Breath of the Wild. The animations are all fantastic, and I really love the style of the game. It's so unique, and despite looking kinda cartoony, it doesn't take away from the experience. If anything, it adds to it. The music is great as always. This is a Zelda game after all. My one issue with this game is, ironically, the Wind Waker itself. I don't like that you have to use it so frequently and this unskippable animation plays every single time. I wish there was a way to skip it or it just stopped playing after a while, but besides that, this game is great. Overall, The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker is fantastic, but not exactly perfect. 8.5 out of 10. Villager's first game is Animal Crossing for the GameCube. My history with Animal Crossing is that I only own New Horizons. I promise I'm qualified enough to talk about this. I played City Folk and New Leaf a bit, but I mostly spend time on New Horizons. I love New Horizons, but one of my biggest problems is just how uninteresting some of the villagers can be. They always seem to cycle between the same three things, but in the original, these villagers are super interesting. I have no idea why they're so much more interesting in the first game than in the newest one. I love talking to them, they all have such interesting and funny things to say. Each of them has so much personality and they're all so fun to talk to. The game starts out pretty strong with you having to work for Tom Nook to pay off your debts. You do things like deliver packages, plant flowers, and talk to villagers. But going from New Horizons to this one, there is so much less to do. I can play New Horizons for hours at a time, but I can't even manage more than one hour of this game. There's just so little to do. Like, sure, I could just fish and find fossils for hours, but why? In New Horizons, it feels like there's always something for me to do. Because of the way the game is set up, you can constantly edit your island to make it look nicer. There is nothing that makes me more insecure than looking at New Horizons islands online and comparing it to my waste hole. I have like almost 100 hours on New Horizons, but I just don't have anything to do in the original. I mean, it's still Animal Crossing, it's still a fun collectathon with the cute quirky personality it's always had, but there just is so little for me to do. Overall, the original Animal Crossing is great, just kinda boring sometimes, 7.5 out of 10. Uh... Mega Man is one of those games I can point to when I say that I don't like a lot of NES games. Mega Man is such a cool and revolutionary game. It was one of the first non-linear games ever made, letting you select which levels you go to and when you go to them. The way Mega Man is set up is you play as this dude named Mega Man, and you can jump and shoot a pew pew out of your arm. You choose between six of these bosses and you go through this romp until you reach the end and fight the boss you chose. 
Once you defeat the boss, you unlock its power, and you can use this instead of your standard Pew Pew. However, you have to charge up these abilities, and you don't have to charge up your Pew Pew, so it's always better to just use that. Each boss is weak to another boss's ability, so you can also use that to quickly defeat them. The levels are all a good length, and they're all pretty visually different for an NES game. The sprite work is also fantastic. The game in general looks very good. So, this all sounds super cool. What was I talking about at the beginning? Well... Okay, Mega Man is a cool and super great game, but it's way too hard. This game is so frustrating and just way too difficult for its own good. If you can defeat the Yellow Devil without the use of the pause trick, you may be the most elite gamer I've ever seen. If you have actually beaten this game on the original NES without any form of exploits, there is no way you actually exist. The platforming is frustrating, the enemies are near impossible to avoid, the game in general needs to be much easier for me to enjoy it personally. Overall, the original Mega Man was revolutionary, but is nowadays way, way too hard. 7 out of 10. Greninja's origin region is Pokemon X and Y, and so far two of these characters have been from games I have a lot of nostalgia for, and Pokemon X will just add to that. This was my first Pokemon game, and looking at its release date is terrifying. I promise I'm not that young, I just never got a Pokemon game before this. But I remember loving the anime and loving the trading card game, and my mom bought this for me when I got my new 3DS. Not like the new 3DS, but buying a 3DS when it was new. I've played through this game a ton of times, and I've always loved it loved it. Kalos is such a great and underrated region. The France inspiration is fantastic. The starters here are… fine. Fennekin is cool, but I just don't like what he evolves into. Chespin is also just okay, and I don't really like what he evolves into. Froakie is the obvious pick here in my opinion. Greninja is the best final evolution, but I think the other two deserve some love sometimes. Greninja gets a little bit too much attention. The new Pokemon in general are all very good, and there was a new type added this region, being Fairy type. I like Fairy type Pokemon, and I think it's generally a good type to have to be the opposite to Dark. The story is pretty okay, it's just kinda like every other one where there's this evil organization trying to manipulate Pokemon. But I will stand by the fact that the best inclusion in this game is Mega Evolutions. While I think things like Dynamaxing are going a little bit too far into the gimmicky side, Mega Evolutions were a great idea. The way it works is only some Pokemon can Mega Evolve, and to do that, you need a specific stone for their evolution, and if you have them hold that, they become a lot stronger in the middle of battle. Also, all of these look super cool. I love the Mega Charizard X I had on my team when I originally played this. Overall, I really like Pokemon X, but the story's a little generic. 8 out of 10. <laughs> What can I really say? It's Pac-Man. Everyone knows Pac-Man. I can't give some super detailed review of this game because there just isn't anything to say. For the aliens watching this, Pac-Man is a game where you play as this yellow guy whose goal is to eat all these pellets. These ghosts will try to stop you and running into them kills you. You can find these power pellets that allow you to eat the ghosts and for a short amount of time you're basically invincible. The game is the definition of easy to play, hard to master. You could probably spend days playing this game and wouldn't even be close to beating it. This is an extremely hard game, but that's why it's fun. It was originally an arcade game after all, and it works well as one. Overall, Pac-Man is a classic and simple game, 7.5 out of 10. Xenoblade Chronicles is fantastic. It was basically my first introduction to the whole genre of RPGs. Shulk is such a cool protagonist, and I just love all the different ideas this game comes up with. The idea of the Bionis and the Mechonis, Shulk's ability to see the future, the battle system, Nopons in general. The game begins with you playing as this guy named Dunban in this intense fight against these robots called the Mechon. You then get double-crossed by your friend and get really injured. And now is where the game really begins. Shulk is in love with Dunban's daughter Fiora, and after she's taken by the Mechonis, Shulk, Dunban, and his friend Ryan all decide to go save her. Through this process, Shulk realizes he's the chosen one, of course, this is an RPG, and he can wield the Xenoblade, I mean the Monado. You then go on this grand adventure, finding new friends and side quests along the way, and the whole time you adventure on one of the best ideas for a map in all of gaming. In the universe of this game, there was a clash between two giants called the Bionis and the Mechonis. They both stabbed each other and died, and thousands of years later, people now live on top of them. On Bionis lived the humans, and on Mechonis lived the robots. These two sides are constantly battling for territory and control. 
Throughout your adventure, you'll venture to many different areas, battle many new enemies, and meet many new friends. It's a great RPG in general with a great story. The characters really shine here too. I love Shulk, Ryan, Fiora, and Ricky, who a lot of people hate for some reason? Look at him! How could you hate him? The graphics are pretty good for running on the Wii, and the game actually looks pretty good sometimes. Finally, the music is absolutely beautiful. Overall, Xenoblade Chronicles is a fantastic RPG. 9 out of 10. Unless I'm mistaken, Bowser Jr.'s first playable game is the recently released Super Mario 3D World plus Bowser's Fury. This game is a remake of Super Mario 3D World, so I think we should talk a little bit about that game. 3D World was not the game it needed to be. When Nintendo announced that they were going to be making a new 3D Mario game, I think it's fair to say that we expected something along the lines of a new open world 3D Mario game, or Galaxy 3 even. But what we ended up with was a very linear 2D Mario game in 3D. Now that we have Odyssey, I can appreciate 3D World a lot more, but when I first bought it, I was actually pretty lukewarm on it. I thought that the game was solid enough, but I just kind of wish that there was a more open world game on the Wii U, and I think that's the reason a lot of people didn't like this game. The game itself is good, but it just wasn't what people wanted. Keep in mind, this was during the new Super Mario Bros era. People were bored of this safe 2D Mario style, and when they expected a new and revolutionary 3D game, but just got this, it wasn't enough. However, this game is now on the Switch, which has a plethora of 3D Mario games, including that brand new open world one. 3D World works a lot better on the Switch, and Bowser's Fury is probably one of the best Wii U ports of all time. They went through and made so many small quality of life changes, like how the stamps are now in color, how the menus are slightly different, how the game now saves in the background. They also went through and made everyone's running speed faster, and it's quite noticeable and makes the game feel really fresh, even on a second playthrough. Finally, they made the Captain Toad levels multiplayer, which is a fantastic change. I recommend this game to anyone, even if you already played 3D World. This isn't just a re-release, it's a new fantastic experience. Overall, Super Mario 3D World plus Bowser's Fu- Oh yeah, Bowser's Fury. The whole reason I did this review. I forgot. Bowser's Fury is also great. It's a short romp through this completely connected world where you find these cat shines to keep Fury Bowser at bay, but eventually you can turn into, uh this and fight Fury Bowser. The completely connected world and normal camera make this feel more like a traditional 3D Mario experience. The whole thing is rock solid and riding Plessy around is super fun. This whole experience is fantastically designed. Overall, Super Mario 3D World plus Bowser's Fury is a fantastic blend of a more linear multiplayer 3D Mario and a more traditional single player 3D Mario. 9 out of 10. <laughs> Duck Hunt is a very weird game. It's a game you don't play with the NES controller, rather you play with the NES Zapper. You aim at these ducks and try to murder as many as you can, and if you don't hit it, you get the first true villain in gaming. The game is super simple, as you literally just shoot at these ducks. You can use clay pigeons, but nothing beats gutting a duck. There really isn't much I can say about Duck Hunt, it's a very simple arcade-like NES game. Overall, there just isn't much to say about it, but it is a pretty solid game in general. 7.5 out of 10. What's odd about Ryu is that I'm going to be looking at Street Fighter 2. As to my knowledge, Street Fighter 1 has never been on a console before 2. Street Fighter 2 is kind of like Street Fighter's Melee, if that makes sense. It's an old game that has fantastic mechanics and is still played to this day. I can see why it's still played, it's a super fun game, and while the inputs can be a little different than what I'm used to, I played a lot of Ken and a ton of Terry when he came out. So I'm pretty used to the Hadouken, Tatsumaki Senpyo Kaku, and Shoryuken inputs. I tried some of the other characters, but I really gravitated towards Ryu and Ken. Is that because they're meant to be starter characters and I already know the inputs? Maybe. But Street Fighter 2 has a great and expansive roster. Whether you want a straight-up brawler like Zangief or a Mozona character like Dalsum, this game has it all. I've never played a real fighting game before, but even I got the hang of this one pretty quickly. There is a bit of a learning curve, but after that, it's super fun. Overall, Street Fighter 2 is a fantastic and fun game. 8.5 out of 10. So, because I forgot, I actually have to review Wii Fit and Little Mac. I forgot to do them last episode somehow, so here they are. Wii Fit is possibly the oddest game on this list, being an exercise game. Using the Wii Balance Board, you can determine your weight, and it gives you exercises to help with that, whether it be yoga, or running in place, or playing these mini-games. 
This game shouldn't necessarily be rated based on how fun it is per se, it should be rated more so on how well it helps you exercise, but still keeps the experience relatively fun. We Fit in general is rather enjoyable. It does feel like a legitimate workout sometimes, and it probably is helping something. The one problem, if you can call it that, is that these mini games are much more fun. They don't provide as much of a workout, but they're much more enjoyable compared to the actual exercises. So every time I boot up this game, I'll end up playing them. Another issue is, once you play it a couple times and you kinda quit for a few days, it's really hard to get back into. But maybe that's just because I'm lazy. Overall, Wii Fit is a pretty good exercise game, 7.5 out of 10. Punch-Out! is the series I want to see Nintendo revive the most. I love all of the Punch-Out! games, but today we review the very first Punch-Out! on the NES. This game is very simple in general, just kinda dodge and then punch. It's a very arcadey feeling game, and I generally don't like that kind of game, but this may be my favorite non-Mario NES game. Just something about the controls, characters, audio, and graphics are all perfect. I like how all the boxers have this little secret you need to abuse to beat them. For example, Hippo Man seems unbeatable. He does tons of damage and seemingly blocks all punches. But to beat him, you actually need to hit him when he opens his mouth. And you may say, isn't that a bit obscure? And yeah, kinda but most of them are a little bit easier. The game is hard, but not impossible, which I can really appreciate after playing other NES games. In this game, you play as a small underdog Little Mac working your way up to the top. You can dodge left and right, move forward, block, and punch left and right. Like I said, pretty simple controls for this game. Overall, there isn't really much I can say about Punch Out. It's simple, but that's why it's great. 8.5 out of 10. Okay, here we go with the actual new characters for this episode. Final Fantasy VII is the most recognizable RPG in all of history. Now, you may debate me on that, but even if you don't know what the game is, just hearing or will sound familiar. Final Fantasy VII is a landmark in gaming history, called possibly the best RPG of all time. Are those people correct? Maybe. Final Fantasy VII lives up to its reputation. The world building, characters, battle system, story, it's all revolutionary. The story of Final Fantasy VII begins with you playing as Cloud Strife, someone who joins an anti-corporate group because of the promise of payment. Throughout the game, however, your quest switches from taking down the evil corporation Shinra to tracking down and killing the famed soldier Sephiroth. You go through this gigantic world hunting down Sephiroth, finding side quests and new friends along the way. The game is so good partly because of the immersion. I myself have found that I'll play for hours getting super immersed in this world. The characters can sometimes have poorly translated or downright funny dialogue, but it doesn't really bother me too much. The battle system is something that I think most can agree is actually really good. In battle, you have a timer that goes up for each party member and your enemies. Once full, you will perform either your melee move or a magic move that takes SP. There's also this thing called limit that slowly increases the more damage you take, and you can unleash these limit breaker moves that are super strong. The battle system is so good because it isn't the normal turn-based thing. The timer system keeps you on your toes, constantly having to make quick decisions because the longer you take, the more time your opponent has to hit you. It feels a lot more immersive than turn-based combat, although it can sometimes be just pressing circles over and over again. I would normally explain the story, but one, it's super complicated, and two, I think it's best to let you experience it if you haven't already. The final boss is really good, and long. Also, the graphics were at the time absolutely revolutionary. And even now, they don't look that bad. There's minimal frame rate dips, and I can always understand exactly what something is supposed to be. The few problems I have with Final Fantasy VII is just that the story is sometimes being too complicated, and to a certain extent, the game can sometimes feel a little ridiculously long. Also, the grindy nature of the game can sometimes make combat feel too repetitive, but overall, Final Fantasy VII is a phenomenal RPG and something that practically brought the genre back to life. 8.5 out of 10. Horns lame, bad game, 7 out of 10. Okay, fine. Fire Emblem Fates is a weird game. There's two options, Fire Emblem Fates Birthright and Fire Emblem Fates Conquest. They follow two different possibilities where Corrin joins different fates, haha, <laughs> get it? For this review, we're going to be looking at Birthright. Fire Emblem Fates is actually pretty good, from what I've heard. I think where it falls a bit flat is Corrin themselves. Korn is ironically the most boring part of the game, and while it may seem impossible to make a silent protagonist intriguing, literally just play any Persona game. Minato and Joker are some of my favorite characters in general. 
But enough about Persona. Fire Emblem Fates is still good. It has intriguing gameplay, great music, and honestly, I just become a little numb from all the Fire Emblem games. So I just don't have much to say about this. I'm sorry Fire Emblem fans, it's not really my thing. Overall, Fire Emblem is a solid 8 out of 10. Bayonetta is something I've never been that into, but I can certainly see the appeal. The characters really shine here. They all feel so alive and are just so fun to interact with. Everything about this game is good actually. The combat system is fun, the music is beautiful, and the graphics are great too. I especially like how unforgiving the game is. While normally it would annoy me, it makes sense since the enemies you're fighting are so strong. It makes sense that one wrong move gets you killed. Speaking on the combat a little bit more, I love the combo system and Witch Time is also super fun. Just the whole combat system in general is so cool. The game's art style isn't really my thing though. I can appreciate the graphical quality, but I didn't really like a lot of the grayish areas. Bayonetta herself is a really fun character though. Cool to see a female lead in a game like this. Overall, Bayonetta is solid, but I don't really have anything in particular to say about it. 8 out of 10. When I first played Splatoon, it legitimately confused me because I couldn't fathom the idea of Nintendo creating a new IP. Splatoon's idea is pretty cool. Basically, it's a 5v5 shooter, but instead of getting kills or capturing a flag or planting something, it's basically just a turf war. The whole inkling thing basically means you're a kid now, you're a squid now. You can basically become a squid in your own ink, and doing so will make you a lot harder to hit, and you will refill your ink. There are a bunch of different weapons to use, from a sniper to a paint roller to a shotgun-like bucket. The weapons and cosmetics are sprawling and pretty impressive. The multiplayer matches are clearly the best part of the game. They're balanced fairly well, and although it may seem bad to aim with the Wii U, it's not impossible. The online component is really good. Remember, this was before the era of Nintendo Switch Online. And my personal favorite part of Splatoon is the world it takes place in. I love having relatively unneeded characters that just add to the world building, like the Squid Sisters, Off the Hook, or the little city you can walk through to customize your stuff and see what people are saying on Miiverse. There's also a story mode, which in my opinion isn't a strong part of the game. I didn't really enjoy it, but it certainly wasn't awful. The game's main content is definitely the online matches, however, and I did enjoy playing it back then, but I think now with Splatoon 2 out and 3 on the horizon, there isn't much of a reason to go back to this one. It's a great start to the series, but 2 and most likely 3 will take the ideas it began with and expand on them a lot more. Overall, Splatoon is a great online turf war with a super unique and fun aesthetic. 8.5 out of 10. The Castlevania series is something I've never been that into, but from what I understand it's about a long lineage of people all from the same family vanquishing Dracula in all the different forms he takes. Beginning in the Middle Ages and the fight against the vampire and the family continuing to this day. Oops, wrong footage. All jokes aside, I've never been that into Castlevania, but I'm excited to begin with the original Castlevania on NES. So first of all, this game looks really, really good for the time. This game is 34 years old and still looks understandable. Next, the sound design and music is absolutely beautiful. I may not be that into Castlevania, but the soundtrack is something anyone can get behind. So the game oozes quality, and maybe my favorite NES game in terms of artistic direction. Now here's where I say that the gameplay is bad, and it's actually not. The gameplay of this game is super fun and doesn't even necessarily feel unfair like a game like Ninja Gaiden. But that isn't to say it's easy. You will die over and over and over to the same guy. This game has absolutely no mercy, and if you die and run out of lives, you go all the way back. And just because I say this game doesn't feel unfair doesn't make it any less frustrating. This game took me out. It's another perfect example of a game that just is too hard. This is such a nice game in terms of art and music, and it's so unfortunate that it's buried under an impossible difficulty. I may sound like a broken record, but overall, Castlevania is beautifully designed, but it just is too hard for my taste. 7.5 out of 10. So, I'm actually debating what Richter's first game is. It seems like it's Castlevania Rondo of Blood, which is technically the earliest appearance of Richter, 
However, Rondo of Blood is for the TurboGrafx-16, which I unfortunately don't have a way to play. However, there was an alternate version of Rondo of Blood released for the SNES titled Castlevania Dracula X, which is similar to Rondo of Blood, but not the same. I will be playing Dracula X for this video, though. If you think Rondo of Blood is the correct answer, then cry about it. As you just saw with Simon, I don't really get Castlevania, but I'm much more into a game like Metroid because of how older Castlevania games are full of trial and error, which I generally don't like. Dracula X, however, I actually liked at first. I liked the controls a lot and the simpler gameplay style. I understood the mechanics rather quickly. The game looked super nice and the music was great as always. And I really, really liked the level design. The whole aesthetic was really, really cool actually. And like I said before, it wasn't too hard. That was until I hit the second stage. The stage itself isn't too hard, but this bad boss is just so incredibly difficult. And even if you get past that, the level design in the latter half of the game becomes a bit less refined in my opinion. And honestly, I stopped enjoying it as much as I previously did. Overall, Castlevania Dracula X is an upgrade from the original, but still maintains some of its problems. 8 out of 10. Pokemon Moon is great. Like, honestly, it's really good. I'm not sure if it's a hot take or not, because I've seen some people say it isn't as good as the others, but honestly, I love Sun and Moon. I think that the best part of it is its design. Alola is one of my favorite Pokemon regions. So much new stuff is here. The Four Island system, the Tapus, the regional variants, the new Rotom decks, and honestly, the Z-moves are really cool. Like yeah, they're a total gimmick, but I still like the idea of them. Also, the new Pokemon are surprisingly good. I really like all of them, especially the Alolan forms. Ninetales, Marowak, and Sandslash are all fantastic. I would say that this is one of the most inspired regions by its real-world counterpart. The Hawaii inspiration really adds to this game's atmosphere. It kind of reminds me of Mario Sunshine, them taking a concept and just running with it the whole game. Although a small addition, the new beans and coffee are just so fun. I always remember going to get a drink at every Pokemon Center. This is actually the Pokemon game I've put the most time into, which may make me seem biased, and I am, but I really do like this game for what it is. If I didn't, I wouldn't have played it for so long. I think one of my only problems with this game is that occasionally the random encounters can still be annoying. I prefer Sword and Shield style of having the Pokemon be visible. The graphics and music are all great. This is just a solid modern Pokemon game. In my opinion, the best since Black and White. Overall, Pokemon Sun and Moon are just great games. 8.5 out of 10. Hey, my name is Cool Nugget, and I'm addicted to talking about Persona games. This is an AA meeting! I really like Persona 5, and for an explanation of why, I'll give it simply. One, I went into this game expecting nothing, as I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Two, I played this game at the beginning of the pandemic, and it kind of kept me sane. And three, it's a very personal game. I understand why many don't like Persona. It works best when you get lost in its world, when you feel that immersion, whether it be spending time with confidants, going to work, or going to the metaverse. But enough about that, let me actually look at this game completely objectively. Mild spoilers for Persona 5, but I won't be going too much into the story. So Persona 5's story is about eight teens who have been unfairly wronged in society. They then gain the power to somehow go into the manifestation of their target's hearts. They can then make those adults have a change of heart and confess to all their crimes. It's quite a simple story, and that was originally my biggest problem, but after Joker gets arrested, don't worry, it happens right at the beginning, so it's not a spoiler. The story suddenly becomes a much more deep analysis. Are they right? Is the freedom to change hearts something that teenagers should really have? Their morality is tested by the final boss, and I'll leave you to see the results. Another thing I've gone without mentioning is Akechi and Joker's relationship, and it's simultaneously one of my favorite and one of my least favorite parts of the game. <laughs> Goro Akechi is a very successful detective who prides himself on how successful he's become. The problem is mostly his personality. Akechi pushes all of his friends away but simultaneously wants them. He wants the approval. And here he sees Joker. Someone with tons of friends. Someone with everything he wants despite being some criminal living in an attic. Their dynamic is great. This whole concept is great, but it falls a little flat. I think that you don't spend enough time with Akechi, and so the relationship they have doesn't feel fleshed out. Also, the little twist at the end feels too much like a Disney movie. But enough about Akechi. My other problem is that the entirety of Akumura's palace is just too hard, poorly designed, and I don't like the story events during that palace. But enough about the parts I don't like. Persona 5 is a beautiful, stylish, and well-told fun and well-designed experience. The gameplay in the normal world is great, studying for tests, going out with friends, and everything in between. In the metaverse, the normal boring turn-based combat is somehow super enjoyable. 
The music is indescribably good. A great mix between a quick song like Last Surprise and a calm song like Beneath the Mask. Overall, Persona 5 is a fantastic, stylish, and beautiful RPG with some problems that are fixed in the remake. 9.5 out of 10. Psst, play Persona 5 Royal. It's a 10 out of 10. I'm sorry in advance. I have literally only played one of these, and even then, not that much. I'm going to be 100% transparent, I don't actually fully finish a lot of the really long games here that I haven't already played. I instead use online reviews or talk to friends who have played them, and ask for their opinion. If I want to get these videos out monthly, I can't really play all the super long RPGs, and not only do I not have the time, I don't even really have a way to play them, so I'm not going to be able to give 4 ratings based on what I've played. I apologize for not being able to properly rate these characters, but just understand it's due to time constraints and just me not being able to play some of them. Here are your four numbers. Banjo-Kazooie is a game those who haven't played are mostly confused on why many people like it. It's just another 3D platform on the N64, right? I mean, there really hasn't been a modern remake or a sequel. So are those people right? Is Banjo-Kazooie just all nostalgia? No. Banjo-Kazooie is fantastic, and that's coming from someone who didn't even play the game as a kid. So what makes it so great? Well, it's mostly just how solid it is. Looking at it, it appears to be some licensed kid-friendly game, which usually aren't that good. But Banjo's world is something that anyone can fall into. The controls and different moves are another reason I enjoy this game so much. The N64 has so many buttons, and they're all used here. There's moves you can only do in the air, moves you need a platform for, moves you can only do on the ground, and even more. The gameplay mostly consists of solving puzzles to find just every collectible you can imagine. Puzzle pieces or jiggies, music notes, jinjos, and new moves. There are nine worlds you can go through, and to get into each, you have to use jiggies to create the full picture, and then you can step into the level. Like I mentioned, in each level you can find all these collectibles, and really that's your only goal. It isn't like there's some boss. You just collect these jiggies, find the jinjos, because if you find all five you get another jiggy. Why I think this game is so good is because it's made by Rare, who very clearly understood the N64 hardware very well. They were killing it with GoldenEye, Diddy Kong Racing, Conker's Bad Fur Day, and Banjo-Kazooie. They were objectively the best third-party developer for the console, and made, in my opinion, some of the best, if not literally the best, N64 games. Most third parties went to Sony, but Rare stayed and honestly perfected the hardware. My one problem with Banjo is that the saving when you leave levels is kinda weird. Normally it's fine, you'll keep your Jinjos and Jiggies, but you lose your music notes, which sucks because there's a hundred of them, so it'd be great if you could leave a level without collecting all of them. But honestly, it's not that big of a deal. Finally, the music is absolutely fantastic. Overall, Banjo-Kazooie is a phenomenal 3D platformer, and you know what? Possibly my favorite N64 game, 9.5 out of 10. Fatal Fury is one of the only franchises I had literally never heard of until they were introduced into Smash. And so after scouring the very confusing history of this series, I found that the first game on the console is Fatal Fury on the Neo Geo. I don't usually enjoy older fighting games due to the lack of single player content, and Fatal Fury is somewhat lacking in this area as well with the only single player content being the King of Fighters mode. The gameplay is actually simpler than Street Fighter, with only weak and strong hits excluding the medium hit. The special inputs were main, and while most Smash fans start crying when they see a quarter circle, I actually half main Terry, so I'm used to the inputs. The gameplay is pretty sharp, but I would prefer a bit quicker gameplay. I actually think I enjoyed Street Fighter more than this. There were only three playable characters at the beginning, and while I can see how the gameplay can be interesting, I think the sequels really, really improve it. The game was fun, but a little too slow and repetitive for me. Overall, Fatal Fury is a great beginning to its series, 8 out of 10. Okay, I know I've given Fire Emblem a hard time, but Three Houses is actually really fun. You play as Byleth, and you can choose from three houses, being Golden Deer, Black Eagles, and Blue Lions. Towards the beginning of the game, you actually have to select which house you want to join, and trust me, this choice matters very much, just believe me on that one. In the game, you're a teacher, and you teach. With your students, you can form relationships and relationships, don't worry, you're like the same age as them, and you can make your students form relationships with each other, allowing them to be more efficient in battle. The characters in general are pretty likable, and even if they're not likable, they're realistic. So the story and characters are all great, but what about the actual gameplay? Well, as a professor, it's fun. Like I mentioned before, I enjoy the interactions you have with your students, and just talking with the characters in general is great. But the actual combat is still great. 
I actually really enjoyed the combat here. I think they perfected the Fire Emblem formula, and despite not liking the older games too much, I enjoy this one. If I had one problem, it would be the repetition of the game, specifically the combat segments. They start to feel a little samey, but after certain events, the game takes a shift into being a much more dramatic story, and I think that's where it shines. Also, the graphics and music are both phenomenal, but female Byleth's eyes look a bit weird, I guess? But that's super nitpicky. Overall, Fire Emblem Three Houses is great, and I actually enjoyed it, surprisingly. 8.5 out of 10. ARMS was never my thing. I never really got into it, even when it was brand new. The gameplay is just a bit boring to me, and while I really like every other aspect of the game, the gameplay is a major part of the game. I really like the music and character design of ARMS, like honestly just the aesthetic and presentation of the game is the highlight, but the gameplay is very, very repetitive and is just kind of boring to me. The way the game functions is you have these boxing matches with extendable arms, and each character has a special ability, like Twin Tails Float. You can just kind of do this for three rounds to see who becomes victorious, but the methodical nature of the punching is just so repetitive for some reason. I think it's because each round lasts pretty long and most people play super campy, but the game is still solid, just kind of boring. Over Overall, I love the world of ARMS, but the gameplay itself is just not refreshing enough. 7.5 out of 10. A Minecraft review is something I've tried to do many times, but I've never actually properly made the video. Part of the reason is because it's Minecraft. You know, the best-selling game of all time? Also, what is Minecraft? Are user-made maps included? What about mods? Servers? Well, here I am, finally doing a proper review of Minecraft. I think one thing most people will agree on is that single-player vanilla Minecraft is kinda boring. Every time I play vanilla alone, I just feel so lonely for some reason, and it's almost always the same. Minecraft is entirely dependent on your environment, and so therefore there will be whole playthroughs where you'll miss out on so much of what the game has to offer. But at the same time, that's part of the beauty of Minecraft. Despite just saying that the game can feel the same, what isn't the same is the world, which is one of the highlights of Minecraft. Another big highlight is the amount of freedom you have. Look at this completely new world compared to this one me and my friends almost maxed out. We have everything, and although that sounds fun, that's another point of conversation. Okay, I'm gonna jump off now. Watch this. I'm gonna fail horribly or die. Minecraft doesn't ever end. Sure, you beat the final boss, but the game continues. This isn't anything necessarily revolutionary, but I do think it's cool. You can keep building up your world, making tasks more and more efficient, and that's really what Minecraft is all about. Efficiency. I'll give a literal example. Here is a mine that I made. Originally it was just a hole in the ground, and to go down and come back up it would take around 2 minutes or so, but now I've added a railway system allowing me to travel much more fast. Taming horses to move faster, filling out maps to get to specific areas quicker, creating automatic experience farms to get levels quicker. At its core, Minecraft's progression is all about stronger tools and efficiency, but that comes with a cost. When I say that Minecraft never ends, that is true, however there is a certain point where there just isn't much to do. Me and my friend played in a world, and we have literally everything. Full enchanted netherite armor, we're super fast and have any resource we'd ever need. And it's boring really. Sure, we could complete all the achievements, but most of those aren't as fun as you think. And honestly, we're done with this world. And I think that my two biggest problems with Minecraft is single player survival isn't that fun in my opinion, and there isn't much to do in endgame content. However, I'm skipping out on another important mode creative mode, where you can fly, have every block and item in the game at your disposal, and can create some pretty cool stuff. That flag looking, that, that banner looks kind of sussy. I used to spend hours making builds in creative mode, but we're skipping out on another one of the best aspects of Minecraft, user-generated content. Firstly, there are adventure maps in which you basically download a world someone else makes and then that takes you on an adventure and you play through it. There are dropper maps, story-based maps, parkour maps, and much more. Texture packs are another big one, allowing the game to look basically however you want, and some people have taken this simple concept very, very far. There are mods that allow any amount of mobs, blocks, and tools to be added to the game. Modded Minecraft Minecraft is truly a different experience, and you can make maps with mods to create even more diverse gameplay. Minecraft has
has a built-in multiplayer system allowing you to connect to anyone's world as long as you have that world's IP. There are some massive servers based around mini games like Mindplex or The Hive, rest in peace. There are some based around creative, roleplay, factions, prison. There are so many different servers that add a whole nother level to this game. And finally, the game is just super fun. Anyone can play and enjoy it. You get sucked into this low poly world. It's truly a sandbox game like no other and is in my opinion the most influential game to come out in the 2010s. Some may call it overrated, and they may be correct, but there's no denying that Minecraft is popular for a reason, and objectively looking at it without any outside forces like the community, you can see why it holds the title of the most popular game of all time. Overall, Minecraft is truly a game like no other, a beautifully crafted and masterful triumph. 9.5 out of 10. I have never liked Xenoblade 2, which sucks because I know that a lot of people love it, but it's just so basic. It doesn't have the same magic that the original Xenoblade does. It's just so uninspired. The characters look exactly how you'd expect them to look, and while those characters have interesting stories, that doesn't make me like the designs anymore. The story is just a bit too basic for my personal taste. Like I said, I feel like it lacks the scope and intrigue of the original Xenoblade. The characters just aren't good, like I'm sorry, but they're either so uninteresting or just unlikable. The combat is fine, I guess, but I still prefer the original. The map isn't nearly as interesting as the original, and yes, I know I keep bringing up the original, but it's the best comparison I can make. Even if I were to properly review it without the first game, I still wouldn't really like it. While I don't necessarily like the map, the visuals are great and the areas are pretty good too. The game does have pop-in and frame rate hiccups though. Like I said, I don't really like the mechanics, or like the upgrade system, or the general game play, but every now and then, I do enjoy it. I can see what they were going for and I do get immersed. It isn't really all bad, but overall, Xenoblade Chronicles 2 just isn't for me and it feels like a major downgrade from its original. 7.5 out of 10. Tekken 1 is super hard. Like, super hard. It has super crazy combos and will take weeks to even properly learn how to combo with one character. But I mean, that's Tekken. That's what it's known for, expansive movesets. But there's a reason you don't see many talk about the original Tekken. It's just its follow-ups, but worse. There isn't much Tekken 1 can call its own, but looking at it as a new game, yeah, it's great. It's a good shake-up from Street Fighter, featuring more moves and being in 3D. Speaking of 3D, the graphics look a bit rough now, or a lot rough now, but at the time, it was pretty good. I think, honestly, Tekken just isn't my thing. It suffers from a lot of the things I dislike about old fighting games. It basically has zero single-player content and being really hard to get into, but it did introduce the world of Tekken, so it has to be given credit for that. Overall, Tekken is good, just a bit too complicated for my personal taste. 7.5 out of 10. Wow. They really did it, huh? Before Kingdom Hearts HD 2.8 Final Chapter Prologue, yes, that is real, we had the original Kingdom Hearts for PS2. Now, this is a game I have absolutely no nostalgia for. It's just any other game to me. And I know a lot of people love this game, so I'm gonna be careful when I say this, but this game has cool gameplay, great area design, fantastic music, and cool characters, but the story. Now, not every game needs some super detailed and dramatic story, but there was a little bit too much power of friendship here for me. Once again, this game is great, I just thought the story could have been a little bit more complex. But where this shines is in all the areas you go to. I'm sure if I played this as a kid, I would have loved it. All these Disney characters and where they come from make for such cool areas to explore. The game in general is great when you look at it from the perspective of being a kid. It's the perfect game for someone who has that childlike wonder in them. If you don't pay attention to the more, uh, questionable parts, you will enjoy this game. Sora is also a really cool protagonist. As much as I don't like the power of friendship thing and Sora is a major part of that, I do enjoy him as a character. The best way I can sum Kingdom Hearts up is great when you're older, perfect as a kid. You can even see in his reveal the type of Disney-like magic Sora has. Overall, the original Kingdom Hearts is great, just not perfect. 8.5 out of 10. Wow, you actually made it to the end. I gotta say, I'm pretty impressed. So this has obviously been a, a very big project of mine, and it feels kind of crazy to be uploading the last video I ever will about it. I don't know, just, I never thought I would be able to do it. I honestly thought I would give up after like part one or part two, but here I am with all four parts in one video. I just want to thank you for actually watching this far and for supporting my channel in general. Just by watching this video, you are helping me tremendously, so thank you. And with all that out of the way, for the final time, don't leave your opinion in the comments. I don't care.